finances is low. Don't know what to do. Can't pay the bills. Someone near, dear to you dies. There's an emptiness left. Marriage is in shambles. You don't know what to do. Or the doctor's given you some terrible news. The resurrection is about having life instead of death. The resurrection is about having hope from God instead of despair in life. He is the one who ignites the soul. He is the one who fills our lives, gives us meaning and purpose, and transforms us by His presence in our lives. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He has won for us a great victory because He's raised from the dead. See, if Jesus remained in the grave, then He's just another spiritual teacher. If Jesus remained in the grave, our preaching is empty, our faith is in vain, and you are still in your sins. What would be the purpose of getting together? What's the point of worship? What's the point? There's nothing to celebrate. There's no hope if Jesus remained in the grave. Your wonder of faith is that Jesus was raised in the great victory of God that day to the glory of the Father, and He defeated death that day so that it is no longer master over us. We have been given hope, and He hope eternal. God sent His Son to be the resurrection and the life, the conquering death. But here's the thing. It must be personally applied. The resurrection of Jesus takes place in the first day of the week, dawning of a new day. It becomes a picture of, that when you receive Christ into your life, it's the dawning of a new day. It's just the beginning of experiencing life, and life to the full and life everlasting. Let's read the account of it. John chapter 19, we begin in verse 35. He who has seen has borne witness, and his witness is true. John is the writer of this gospel, and he is referring to himself here. He walked with Jesus. He is an eyewitness of all of these things. And he wrote a witness down for us, the Gospel of John. So he says, He who has seen is one witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth, so that you also may believe. These things came to pass, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, that a bone of him shall be broken. And then another Scripture says, They shall look on him whom they shall whom they pierce. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews. Who, who is Joseph of Arimathea? I think it's important we understand this. Joseph of Arimathea was a prominent leader in Israel. Very wealthy man. On the Sanhedrin. A great reputation as a great leader in Israel. And he was a disciple of Jesus. He went and he asked Pilate, this is Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, he's the one who gave the, the, the command that Jesus be crucified. Joseph went to Pilate and asked that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted the permission. He came, therefore, and took away his body, and Nicodemus came also. Nicodemus, we should know who he is, also a very prominent, significant leader in Israel. He is the one who came to Jesus at night in John 3, and it was to Nicodemus that we uh, have that great verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So Nicodemus came also, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds of it. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, on account of the Jewish day of preparation, because the tomb is nearby, they made Jesus there. If you ever have an opportunity to go to Israel, this is the absolute highlight of the trip. We always save it for the last day. Because this beautiful garden setting, the tomb, you get to duck in and go inside. It is a moving retreat. The hill called Golgotha is right there. And he died. They laid him in the tomb. Chapter 20, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark 
and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and she came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, that's John referring to himself when he mentioned him in the morning. And she said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. I find it very fascinating that John had to include that fact. Apparently he wants everybody to know he's faster than Peter. Verse 5, And then stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, therefore, also came following him, and he entered the tomb. There's old Simon Peter there. And he beheld the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb entered then also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own home. But Mary was standing outside the tomb and weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped, and she looked into the tomb. She beheld two angels in white sitting, one at the head, one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around, and she beheld Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, you have carried him away. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, She turned, and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brother, and you say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father. My God and your God. So Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. What a glorious and powerful account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's important for us to understand how it applies to us personally. One of the things we need to grasp right away is this, that God has made a way to be right with him. God has made a way. Let's start by understanding that God is the one who is seeking relationships with you. God is the one who is pursuing. God is the one who is knocking on the door of your heart. That's really important because many people have this in reverse where they think somehow that they've got to go and find God. They have to seek after Him. No, God seeks after you. God is on the move. God seeks relationships with you. He loves you so much. But he made a way for you to have a relationship with him. See, let's step back and see the big picture. How is it possible that a sinner can have a relationship to a holy God? How is that possible? God has made a way. Through Jesus Christ. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has fallen short of living righteously before God. And really, that is the first step of getting right before God. Admitting that you're a sinner. It starts with that first step. Acknowledging our great need for forgiveness. And then we need to understand this, that God makes sinners righteous. See, this is also important because many people have that in reverse. Many people think that somehow sinners have to make themselves righteous. No, God makes sinners righteous. You see, our problem is that Sin has caused a great chasm between us and God. And we got a lot of sins that make for a huge chasm. You know that everything you've ever done or said is written down? Can you imagine? Just imagine if somebody followed you around with a notebook and wrote down every sin you ever did, said, every thought. How many pages would be in that notebook? 
Or maybe it would be better to say, how many notebooks is it going to take to contain all of that? You see, that reveals to us the greatest truth known to man. Our sins are forgiven in full. Paid in full because they were paid when Jesus paid for them on the cross that day when He died on the hill called Golgotha. Every sin on every page in every notebook has been paid in full. Do you have assurance of knowing that you're right with God? You can. God has made a way for you to have the assurance and to know beyond knowing that you are right with God. How is that possible? God has made a way. God can forgive every one of your sins because He Himself paid the price. 2 Corinthians chapter 5.21 He made Him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin on our behalf. God took all of the sins of the world and placed them on Christ when He died on the cross. That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What a wonderful understanding. Our sins placed on the cross. The righteousness of Jesus placed upon us. God makes sin as righteous. Romans 8, verses 1 and 3. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I say it perhaps a little more boldly? Therefore, there is now no damnation. That's a little more accurate. For those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do, could make the right weak as it was to the flesh, God did it. God did it by sending His own Son in the likeness of sin, sinful flesh as an offering for sin. Well, what about the one who says, well, I haven't lived that bad of a life. I've actually been a pretty good person. What about me? Well, I'm glad you are. Pastor Greg Laurie tells a story that I think just explains, gives an answer powerfully, beautifully. The story goes like this. The man dies, and he's met by Peter at the pearly gate. That's how you know he's the true faith. And Peter says to him, okay, here's how it works. Uh, it takes a thousand points to get into heaven. You tell me all the good things you've done, and I'll tell you how many points is worth. All right. He felt pretty good about himself. I have been married to the same woman for 56 years, and I have been faithful to her every single day of that marriage. I was even faithful in my heart. Very, very commendable. Three points. Three. Three points? How many do I need? A thousand. Okay. I went to church every Sunday. Even went to the Midland Church. Taught Bible study for 15 years, and I tithed the first portion of everything I received. Very commendable, Peter said. Very good. One point. Uh, okay. I started a soup kitchen so that I could help feed the homeless, and I visited the sick in the hospital as a volunteer chaplain for years. Very, very good. Two points. Two points. Not at this rate, it's going to take the grace of God to get me in. That's worth a thousand points. Come right on in. See, there's the point. You know, no matter how much good a person has done in their life, when you compare that to the holiness of God, the Scripture says it's like filthy rags. There is no one who is going to make himself so righteous that God says, oh, I can't help myself. You must just come in. I'm so impressed with your life. Every sinner needs the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. God gives us a hope and a hope eternal on which we can have the assurance that God has made us right. But not only that, but God gives us power to live victoriously right now. See, this is important. It must be seen as significant now. The power of the resurrection, Scripture tells us, is the same power that works in our lives by the Holy Spirit filling our lives. The same power works in us that works in Him. John chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Listen. Because I live, you will live also. Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised, raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. This is like a theme that runs through the entire Bible. I'm going to fill you with life. And you see, living victoriously has everything to do with what fills your heart. This is the whole theme that we've been studying in the book of Ephesians. You want to live the victorious life? It has everything to do with what is filling your heart. God wants to fill you with the joy of the Lord. Peace that passes and understanding. To experience the love of Christ that ignites the soul. To fill you with the Holy Spirit, which is the life of God. The problem is this. People are filling their lives with things that frankly poison their soul. To quote the famous American philosopher Waylon Jennings, people are looking for love in all the wrong places. Every one of us looking for love. There's a there's an aspect of the human soul that desires, prays for, longs to be loved. But you're looking for love in all the wrong places. And what happens is that people mess up their lives. They poison their souls. See, all of those old things that mess up your life must pass away. And God will build new things in your life. Fill you with the joy of the Lord. Peace that passes understanding. Love that ignites your soul. Holy Spirit that brings life. See, the glorious truth is that all of those things were won that day when Christ was raised from the dead. But we must see it twisted. And here's what I mean. You must become part of the story. You must become part of the story. Back to John 19. We were reading about Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Leading prominent people of Israel. They were followers, disciples of Jesus Christ. But secretly, for fear of the Jews. See, it's important for us to understand because some people, they, they, they look at all of the events of Jesus and the, the cross in which he died, the resurrection, and they stand back and kind of are loose. That's a very interesting thing. But they don't apply it. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were there. They were there when, after Jesus was arrested and dragged before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, and they brought all this mocking of a trial and false witnesses were accusing him. They were there. They were leaders. They were guilty. They felt it in their heart. They knew this, this, is, this is wrong. These charges are false. This is a man of God. They said nothing. They did nothing. When they brought him before Pontius Pilate, then Pontius Pilate was, was trying to find a way to set him free and brought him out in front of the crowd. Behold the man. The crowd, screwed up by the Jewish leaders, started to cry out, Crucify him! Crucify him! They were there. There was something in their souls. This is not fair. It's not right. They said nothing. They did nothing. Pilate gave the command to the Jews. They said nothing. The beating, the spitting, the mocking, pressing a crown of thorns into his head, the scourging, leaving him bloody. Within an inch of his life. Something inside. He knew this is a man of God. This is not right. They said nothing. They did nothing. They were there when Jesus carried up the cross up the Via Dolorosa. As they laid him on the cross and put the nails into his hands and his feet, he cried out in pain. 
Did you raise them up on the stanchion and they listened? And she cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Something is clear. To tell us that, Jesus said, it is finished. Father, into your hands. Secret disciples no more. Enough. They risked everything. Went to, uh, went to Pontius Pilate requesting the body. Grab it. They went. One of them would have gotten a, a ladder, climbed up, releasing the nails. Other one down below, taking hold as the body fell upon him, lowering, lowering him to the ground as they began to wash. Can you imagine what they would have looked like? Jesus is blood all over them. Oh, they're involved now. Secret disciples are no more. There's a time to make a stand. There's a time to declare it. There's a time to say it. Here's why this is so important. Because it reveals a great spiritual truth. His blood must be applied. Must be applied personally. There's a spiritual truth seen in here. It's personal. His blood all over them. What a commitment. You know, Jesus died during the Jewish feast called Passover. All the Jewish feasts pointed to Jesus. But the Jewish feast of the Passover was particularly clear. On that day, that Passover, it's when it comes from when Israel was in Egypt, a slave, and God was going to set them free. And so they had to take the blood of a lamb, an unblemished, perfect lamb, and take a hyssop branch, dip it into the blood, and put it onto the doorpost of their house and onto the lentil of the house, which would have dripped down. Interestingly, they just formed a cross in doing that. They enter in through that blood, and they're safe in their houses as the angel of condemnation or angel of death passes through that land. They are safe. They are free. What a picture of Jesus Christ whose blood must be applied because it reveals a great spiritual truth. Let me build a case. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 23. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've understood that. We're all sinners. Romans six twenty three. For the wages of sin is death. Now, if the wages of sin is death, we're all in big trouble. Because we're all sinners. And therefore... Everyone deserves death. But when the blood of Jesus is applied, then the death of Jesus is applied. And the consequences of sin is paid in full. It's paid for, it's paid for, it's applied to our life. Romans chapter 6, verses 2 to 4. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we've been buried with Him through baptism into death. This is why it's so important that people are baptized in water. Now, let me make something very clear. People are not saved because they're baptized. They're baptized because they're saved. And it's a picture for us of what Christ has done in our lives. It's a declaration to the world. I am unashamedly, boldly declaring it. It's like His blood is all over me. I am a secret disciple no more. I want the world to know that He has paid for my sins and I am free in Christ. So what happens when we baptize someone? We actually, and by the way, we're having a baptism service in just a few weeks. We lay them down in the water actually in the posture of dying. So they will like cross their, their arms like this but we lay them down in the water just as a person would be laid down in the in a, in a coffin so they could be laid into the grave. And there's probably people here who are saying, now pastor, listen, we came here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you're laying people in the grave. 
I got friends here with me. I mean, come on, Pastor. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We don't actually leave them in the water, okay? We bring them up out of the water. And when we do, when we bring them up out of the water, everybody in the crowd, he's like hooting and hollering and shouting and celebrating. Yay! Because it's a picture that we are raised with Christ. When he was raised from the dead, we have his death applied to us and we have his resurrection life applied to us as well. We are living the resurrected life. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are living the resurrected life right where you sit in that chair. It's a hope that is eternal. That's why he says in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 to 5, As Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Hey, if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Here's another one. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, means in this body of ours, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Death has been defeated. There's no longer a dark cloud of condemnation hanging over our heads. Eternal life is the ground on which we stand. See, that's why he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sin? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Makes all the difference in the world. When this is applied to your life, it makes all the difference in the world because it makes all the difference in eternity. Here's the thing. Jesus is pursuing you. Jesus is seeking relationship with you. But he doesn't give hints. You know how we kind of sometimes give hints. Oh, no. He's boldly knocking on the door of your heart because he wants you to open the door of your heart and to find your life in him. There it is. Find your life in him. Chapter 20 brings us to the morning of the resurrection. First day of the week. Still dark. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb, bringing more spices, no doubt, to wrap his body. She was a devoted follower of Jesus, did not leave him throughout all of that suffering, the crucifixion. He was the last to leave and the first to arrive at the tomb. Oh, she had so much love for him. She loved Jesus because, no doubt, of all that he had done for her. She was a troubled girl. She had troubles in her past, but Jesus healed her of it all. At one point it says he, he healed her of seven demons. Oh, she had experienced all of the pleasures of the world and all the trouble to come. And she set her free. She set her free, forgave her, and gave to her a life of love. A glorious life. Took away all the sin. of being the first one to see the risen Lord. Then in the first century, women didn't get the respect they deserved. This was a great honor. Jesus could have appeared to any number of powerful, prominent leaders. Right? Could have appeared to, to Herod. Didn't respect him. Called him his father. Could have appeared to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor that gave the command to crucify him. Could have come to Pontius Pilate. personal this is. They've taken away my Lord, she said. But it's when Jesus says to her, it's when he says her name, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, he calls out to me. He calls out to me. There's a stirring inside of me. If anyone hears my voice and will open the door to the door, I will come in. I'll come with him. I'll have a relationship. Die tonight. Are you ready 
life with God. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and ask Him to forgive your sins because He makes you right. Are you ready to meet the Lord? What if He came back? What if He came back today or tonight? Would you be ready? You don't know when death is going to come. You may, you may think, oh, I'm going to live a long life. to give you an opportunity to get right with God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to draw a line, you might say. There's a time to make a stand. There's a time to stand up and say, thank you, God, for what you want to do. I receive it. I receive it. Let's all bow our heads. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to this earth to die on the cross and to rise again. And now he offers forgiveness to those who will believe. Help those who did not know you to receive forgiveness. We are praying, Lord. So all, all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed in prayer. How many of you today, how many of you would say, I want Jesus to come into my life. I want him to forgive me of my sin. I want to know with certainty that I will go to heaven when I die. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. See, if that's your desire, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want Him to forgive you of your sins, I want you to lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. If you want Christ in your life, if you want forgiveness, if you want your guilt taken away, I'm going to ask you to just lift up your hand right where you are. God bless you. God bless you. Many hands. I see you in the back, middle, back in that section. Anyone, just raise your hand in boldness. Maybe you would say this while our heads are bowed. Maybe some of you would say, I haven't been right with God for a long time. I've fallen away. I've walked away. I'm ashamed of it. Listen, don't be ashamed. You're here. God has called your name. You're here. We're glad you're here. This is the day for you to come back. This is the day for you to return to the Lord. You need to make a recommitment to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that you would also lift up your hand. Just lift up your hand to the Lord as well. I want to pray with you in just a minute. Everyone that Jesus calls, He calls openly and He calls publicly. Jesus said, if you would acknowledge me before people, I will acknowledge you before the Father and the angels of heaven. But if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before the Father and angels of heaven. Here's what I'm asking. I want you to make a stand. It's a time to make a stand. So wherever you are, if you have raised your hand, and even if you did not, you want your sin forgiven, want Christ to come into your life, to know that you're going to heaven when you die, if you're making a commitment or making a recommitment, I want you to stand on your feet right where you are. I'm going to lead you in prayer. Just be bold. God, just say, God bless you. Just stand right where you are. Many people just stand right where you are. If you're making that decision today, I want you to stand right where you are. Whether it's a recommitment or asking Christ in the first time, you just stand right where you are. Anybody else? I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. I want you to stand on your feet. Be bold. It's a time to make a stand. Anyone else? This is your moment. This is the day of salvation. This is the, the great day to mark it. Easter 2016. The day I committed my life. The day I recommitted my life. It's like your spiritual birthday. I'm going to lead you in a prayer where you're going to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior. He'll come into your life. He says, whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast out. You say yes, and he'll say yes to you. I'm going to pray for you, and as I pray this, you pray out loud after me in church. Will you just support them by also you just praying with them? Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross and shed his blood for every sin I've ever committed. I'm sorry for my sins. I turn from it now. I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and friend. Thank you for calling me, and thank you for loving me.
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.